one to the Sterling Lecture on Modern Israel by a professor and minister, um, Yossi Balin, on his new autobiography that just came out, Secrets I Won't Take With Me. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, before I introduce Yossi Balin, I want to thank all of our um, co-sponsors across campus. So um, the James Madison College, the Residential College of Arts and Humanities, the College of Social Science, um, the College of Arts and Letters, the Office of Institutional Diversity, the Peace and Justice Studies Program, the Muslim Studies Program, uh, International Studies and Programs, the Political Science Department, and the History Department all co-sponsored this event um, that the Sterling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel uh, is sponsoring. So we're really uh, pleased with all the support we have uh, across the campus for putting on this lecture. And I'd also like to thank Michael and Lane Serling, who are here with us today, who, uh, um, with their support, making lectures like this possible at MSU. So we're really appreciative of that. So without further ado, it's a real honor uh, to have Yossi Bailing with us today. He's chairman of the board and president of Bailing International, which is a consulting firm. Um, and chairman of the Steering Committee of Education for Peace of the Geneva Initiative. He's a, he was a global distinguished scholar at NYU. Um, but uh, more importantly, perhaps, there's this huge impact on Israeli politics, on um, the history of uh, peace negotiations and efforts that he's dedicated much of his life to. Um, so he was Minister of Justice, Minister of Religious Affairs, Minister's Office of Prime Minister, Minister of Economy and Planning, Defi Deputy Foreign Minister, Deputy Finance Minister. He's also a political scientist who got his PhD at Tel Aviv University in political science and uh, has taught at Tel Aviv University as well. He's co-founder of the Economic Cooperation Foundation, uh, and he also has written um, several books. So I know um, some students in, in uh, my international relations class are reading his book, The Path to Geneva, The Quest for a Permanent Agreement. Uh, he's also written Manual for a Wounded Dove, His Brother's Keeper, From Socialism to Social Liberalism, The Manual for Leaving Lebanon, a book called Touching Peace, um, A Concise Political History of Israel, and the book, the most recent book, which is Sons in the Shadow of Their Fathers, uh, Secrets I Won't Take With Me in 2021. But as many of you know, he's had a humongous impact, and among those, he was the architect of the Geneva Inter Initiative, um, for peace negotiations between Israel and Palestine, which we'll hear more about, and also process and done so many more things as well. Um, before I call on Yossi Balin, I just wanted to invite all of you to come back on Sunday uh, from 11 to 1 in this room. And it's going to be a really exciting panel that will include Yossi Balin, but also include Hiba Husseini, Omar Dajani, Saliba Sarsar, and Israela Oron. And they are. Um, some of the Israelis and Palestinians that have previously negotiated, been part of uh, peace negotiations together, and that have come together with others to write a 100-page document on confederation as a facil facilitator of a two-state solution to continually try to find ways um, to ease the path to trying to um, get to a peace agreement. Uh, so uh, it's our honor to have you, and we welcome you, and then we'll welcome questions afterwards. You can just go to the mic that microphone in the middle since it's being live streamed so that everyone listening to the live stream can also hear you and don't be shy about asking questions. So thank you so much, Yossi. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Aronoff uh, suggested that uh, we will have a discussion which will be much less uh, political and more personal. And uh, of course, we will deal with uh, policy issues and peace and war, but uh, I, I, can, I cannot say no to Professor Aronoff, uh, because one of the reasons the, one of the main reasons is that uh, her father was my instructor in my PhD dissertation. So what can I do? And I love him. Um, Mike Aronoff. Um, now, of course, I, I don't know you, and I don't know how much involved are you, how much knowledgeable are you, about uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. And uh, 
it, it makes it always difficult. Uh, but what I ask you to do is when I'm talking and I'm referring to issues and subjects which are obvious for me, but not obvious for you, please don't be shy and, and raise your hand and ask what do I mean by that? Uh, because otherwise, uh, what are we doing? I mean, it will be of no avail. Um, now, this is not something, a lecture that I'm, I'm delivering, uh, usually. I, I actually, I believe I never did it. So, uh, I, I'll tell you some, some, about some milestones in my, uh, in my life, which brought me to deal in, uh, so uh, intensively with uh, searching solutions for the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict and suggesting uh, ideas. I was born a few weeks after the establishment of Israel. Always envied those who were born exactly on that day, uh, which was May 14, uh, 48, because they were, they, they were called, uh, summoned every year to the president of Israel, and there was a party for them. And I, uh, I came a little bit late. So there was no party for me. But I, I was really uh, one of the first children uh, in my country. Three years after the Holocaust, to live in Israel after the Holocaust, now I can tell you, you know, when it happens, you, you, you don't, you cannot compare, you don't know exactly what does it mean. Of course, when I, as a child, people did not, I mean, my parents and others did not talk to me about the Holocaust because it was too difficult to explain what happened there and why. So what happened was that the, the streets of Tel Aviv hosted survivors, some of them were mentally sick. Some of them used to run after us children. There was a lady with a stick, and we were so afraid of them. Some of them talked to themselves. There was a tailor who used to sit uh, at the entrance of one of the houses in Tel Aviv. Um, who worked on uh, on shoes? He, he 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 created shoes. I don't remember from what, but it was a very tense atmosphere and a, a very heavy one, especially because of the unknown. You always are afraid of the unknown. And since nobody explained to you anything, and I didn't know what to ask about the Holocaust, the only thing that I knew that there are people from the Holocaust. This is what was said to us children. That was on the one hand. On the other hand, there was the huge immigration to Israel. Immediately after the establishment of the state, Israel absorbed a number of, of uh, newcomers, which was twice its size in 48. It was crazy. I mean, usually we, we compare it to, it happened in the United States, it would be, I don't know what, uh, millions and millions and millions. It, you cannot compare it. But the, the, the number was uh, about one million and a half in, in, in uh, three years in a poor country which was totally dependent on the, our American rich brethren to, to help us to absorb it. 
It was austerity, I mean, a, a, an official policy of austerity. And everything was measured. I did not feel as a poor guy. I mean, my, my father worked in a bank. Uh, my mother was a lecturer. It was a middle class uh, uh, family. If you compare it to today, it was a very poor one. But then it was fine, fine. And uh, my, my parents uh, volunteered to teach uh, Hebrew, uh, the newcomers. It was a, a wave of, of uh, volunteerism. There were many uh, veteran, uh, veteran Israelis who uh, decided to help uh, the new immigrants from different aspects, but Hebrew, it was the most important one, because if you don't speak, I don't have to tell you the language of, of the country where you live, uh, you are a stranger forever. So th these were the, the different uh, 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 components of, uh, of my childhood. While I myself uh, was brought up in a home which was full of books, all the, the rooms, there were sh bookshelves. And uh, for whatever reason, my, uh, my parents did not uh, instruct me what books should I read. So I read it according to the order on the shelves. Some of them were not for children, but I read it, sorry. And uh, so I, I would read these books and, and the books that I could uh, uh, ex uh, learn from the, uh, the uh, from school. Um, um, and there was another shop in which I could borrow uh, uh, books but they did not allow me to borrow it twice a day. So it was a problem. I took only once a day. So I was really a bookworm, comme il faut. And uh, I, I, I was very good at school. I, I had a patent, I used to prepare my homework for the next lesson. Meaning, I already knew what should I know for the current lesson, because I read all the material for the next one. What you have to do is just to prepare homework twice, but to do it once. And then you are always ahead of your class. You cannot do it in all the subjects, but in some of them, you know in advance what will be taught the next, uh, the next lesson, so you can prepare for that. And uh, so I, I knew a lot, I read a lot. I was a good boy. Um, doesn't mean that my parents have, had not uh, complaints about me mainly that I'm not playing enough. They were worried that I'm not playing enough. You know these kids? There are some. I, I'm, I'm not a president. But, uh, and I, I hated to, to waste time. This was my, my, the worst scene in my view as a child. I remember debating with my mother. She wanted me to, to have a, uh, uh, to sleep uh, in the afternoon or at noon. And I said, why? You are taking an hour of my life. Yeah. And it was, it was difficult for them to, to accept uh, this, uh, crazy, these crazy ideas. But um, what, is, what was important for them was that since I, I brought uh, very high marks, that I will not brag. Don't brag, 
I mean, there are other people have other advantages. So being the first in class is not uh, the, the only one. And uh, you have your shortcomings. And they have the, their advantages, which I believe is, is really true. And, uh, and then I, I finished uh, high school as the best uh, student in, the, uh, in my uh, cohort. Um, which, which gave me some kind of uh, self-confidence, I would say. But I was, I, I tried not to brag. I, I, I think that I succeeded even. And then I, I, I was drafted. I went to uh, the army. And in no time, there was a war. Now. I want to tell you that in the years 57, 67, there were, these were the 10 quiet years of Israel between the uh, Sinai War of 57 and the, or 56 actually, uh, and the 67 War of 67. Uh, very few terrorist attacks here and there. But generally speaking, af after 10 years, or almost 10 years of violence between 48 and, four, and 56, 57, there were 10 years of a very quiet situation. When you look back, there were never, never more quiet years in, in Israel. So the notion was that the era of, of wars was behind us. Uh, they shortened the, the period of uh, so, uh, the, the service in the army from three years to two months, two years and two months. Then they extended it and extended it. But the, be, because also the army felt that uh, there is no real ch uh, challenge to Israel now, and we don't need such a long uh, service uh, uh, in the army. And, um, and then out of the blue, out of the blue, there was this uh, 67 war. And be before that, there were uh, uh, weeks of uh, uh, waiting for, for something to happen. Maybe it could be uh, prevented with the help of the United States. The whole story is long and interesting. But uh, I, I find myself a, a soldier in war. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was very, very strange. For the first time, I saw dead people. And the uh, Egyptian soldiers, and then Syrian soldiers, and uh, for me it was not the, a molding uh, event, but somehow you feel different when you you find yourself in in the field, and you feel that you may be killed easily. I mean, it is touch and go. And uh, then I, I, uh, I finished after three years the, the, the service. And uh, I became a reporter for a daily in Israel. It doesn't exist anymore. Its name is Davar, was Davar. And uh, I began my studies in the university. I married. Um, I was a very, very busy uh, uh, person. And um, I, stud I studied political science because I was very, very interested in politics. And, um, and my doctorate uh, was intergenerational fr frictions in three parties in Israel. Because the issue of age in politics was very, very important for me. I felt that it was important. 
but I needed the, the scientific tools to analyze it. And what happened to me is that the, the studies in the university, but especially my doctorate itself, the work on the, on the thesis, molded my, uh, my behavior in politics. You know, people say eh, he did not or she did not uh, study in the university, but she, they studied in the university of life. Nonsense. Nonsense. Life, I mean, the problem about life is that it doesn't repeat itself. You live once. In, while studying, you can, add, you, you can read the, a book again or, 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 uh, or look into the material deeper or, or, or whatever. But the, the importance of, of studying in that context is that you are studying the essence of, of things. And you can, and things which seem to those who do not know such material as unique, as precedent, or whatever, are actually kind of social laws, like the iron law of oligarchy. It repeats itself and repeats itself and repeats itself, as if, you know, all those Putins in the world who have been there for so long Uh, as if they read it or studied it or whatever. Maybe he did, I don't know. But if you are too long in politics, you, you are too long in, in, in power, eventually you are corrupt, eventually you are becoming exactly as those people whom you tried to replace and to purify the system. And this is only one, one example. But I, I would like to share with you some other uh, uh, examples. One of it is that every politician believes that he or she cannot stop being there because of two things. One, they have some more challenges on their desk and they cannot just decide that they are uh, closing the shop and going home. And another, because had there been younger people to replace them, they would have easily uh, gone whatever to, uh, and retired. But nobody is around. I mean, I. I couldn't believe it when I studied about it until I saw it. I mean, people said it to me. And I said, what does it mean nobody can replace you? The, the whole point is that you, have, you are more experienced, so you know more things. But it doesn't mean that nobody can uh, replace you. It means that the, the one who is replacing you will need some time in order to learn the same things and to invent new things, and to touch reality, while you are detached from reality, because you have been there for too long. Another point is that there is nothing like just generational conflict. The conflict is between generational units. It, the fact that you are in your 20s, doesn't mean that you have a message to people in their 40s or in their 60s. As a group of people of, uh, th that have one de common denominator, which is the age. No. But in every age, there are, or there can be, it's not a rule, but there can be generational units which had, have a message. And their message, which is actually the ability or, or their 
way to see the world from one angle or another. They interpret the same events. Take now the war between Russia and Ukraine. You can interpret it from different angles. And each, each angle creates a kind of a generational unit of people who are sure that they are right, of course, and that the, the, the war is about uh, black and white, the good people against the, the bad people, or that it is a proxy war, or, or whatever. Now, these generation, these units, if they are not co-opted by the older generation, may have a real impact on history. And my own lesson from, from uh, my, my research into the issue of age and politics, and I recommend to you, I mean, if you are thinking about issues, it, there is much room uh, in this area. And age is playing a huge, a huge uh, a role in political life, and not only there, of course. Uh, so you can understand many, thing, many things just by the question of the distance between people and their horizon. It's obvious that people, people in my age, even if they intellectually understand the need to plan for the long range, it's more difficult for them because they know that they will not be there. But somebody in his 30s or in his 40s can, in an easier way, to think about the future and to say, well, this is a plan for 40 years. I cannot say something like that. So the, difference, the differences are very deep and are very, very influential because they, may, they, they, are, they can explain the, the difference between policies. So, the, the, what I did what, when I was uh, elected to the parliament, to the Knesset, the first thing that I did is to uh, convene six members who were more or less my age from my party, the Labour Party, and eventually we became eight, and we became, in, in the story of Israel, the, the group of eight. We sh shared the same uh, view about social affairs, the welfare state and, and whatever, and about peace between Israel and, uh, and the Palestinians. We saw in it a major issue that cannot be put aside, that cannot be ignored, both because of the suffering of the occupies, of the Palestinians, and because of the need to fulfill the Zionist idea, which is not a colonialist idea, and not an imperialist idea, but it, an idea to convene Jews who were persecuted in so many places in the world, to give them a shelter and to assure a Jewish majority in a democratic state without oppressing others. So this was, generally speaking, our ideology. We were not co-opted by the older generation, although they tried to suggest uh, different roles for us. We did not submit to it. And we, we became the most important uh, uh, power in the Labour Party in the, in the 90s and changed its platform. For example, one of the issues that we fought for was allowing uh, Israelis to talk to the PLO members. There was a law which forbade it. And in the party conference, uh, there was a, a nice majority to support our change, which eventually was conducive to the change of the law, which eventually allowed me to initiate 
the, the Oslo process, which was the first contact between Israelis and the, and the PLO. So what I wanted to tell you is that I, I may be the, the ideal type to prove the importance of, of studying for, for life. I mean, it is not something that you said, okay, I made my BA, MA, I'm now a PhD, and now I'm going to the world to do, to do something else. No. In many areas, you can really uh, understand things and, and, and fight for things as a result of what you know for so, from social and political laws which exist. Now, between 84 and 88, uh, I was uh, a part of the bureaucracy, although it was not a secret that I was a very, very political person. I was uh, prominent in the young guard of the Labour Party, and I, I was the spokesman for the Labour Party. But I became, in 84, the secretary uh, of the cabinet. Now, it's a title. What is the secretary of the cabinet? I mean, he reminds people about uh, the agenda. I mean, what, what does he do? What, what does he do? And uh, I must admit, although I was uh, teaching in the university for 13 years and I, thought, I, I taught uh, political science, um, I did not know exactly what does a cabinet secretary do beside the, the law. The law refers to the cabinet uh, secretary in some law, uh, lines, and, uh, but the daily work of the cabinet secretary is fascinating. Just to, to share it with you, M many Israelis don't know it. Why should they? The, the cabinet secretary is the person who is in charge of the daily work of the cabinet under the prime minister. So he is privy to many, many secrets. He participates in the most uh, sensitive meetings. There is nothing which is almost nothing. I, I don't want to say nothing, but it is almost nothing that he is not uh, privy to. And he, he participates in all the cabinet meetings, in all the sub-cabinet meetings, meaning committees of the cabinet which deal with specific issues. And he has to, to uh, put the, is the, the different issues on the agenda to assure that the ministers get the information and to try and find solutions and compromises between ministers. Because in many, so many cases, there is a conflict of interest between the ministries. Every minister is defending his or her ministry, uh, and, uh, and you have to, to find solutions. And I'll tell you where, where are these compromises uh, uh, relevant. Imagine a meeting of the cabinet. People come and go. Somebody comes in with sandwiches, sometimes beverage. Some people go out. They they are calling a uh, they are calling a uh, uh, somebody called them on the phone, whatever. Now, at the end of the meeting, the prime minister sums up the debate. And uh, there is a vote sometimes. Sometimes it is, there is even no, no vote about it. In Britain, by the way, there are no votes. But we, in, in Israel, you have votes because there, there are many parties in, in the coalition and, and there are differences between them. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the prime minister may say something like, okay, I, I believe that uh, the idea of uh, John Smith is accepted. Yes, yes, they are nodding. You, as a cabinet minister, have to write down the resolution. What did the cabinet 
decide. And sometimes you are the one who, are, who is informing the, the media about these resolutions. But the resolutions were not uh, read out. I mean, now you have to go back to John Smith to see what he said, to understand from it what he wanted as a resolution, knowing that the, the, the prime minister and the cabinet agreed to it. So you are the one who writes the resolutions. And sometimes ministers are coming to you and say, no, this is not what we decided. Or it, hurt, it hurts my ministry. I didn't notice that. So you call the ministers, and they come to you. And together, you are finding the compromise after the resolution was taken. This is something that people don't know. And usually, it doesn't create crisis. But it is a very, very difficult job. And you have to be knowledgeable about the sensitivities of the ministers to understand what they really need, and sometimes to tell them that they are wrong. And then I became the, the director general of the foreign ministry, which was uh, very, interest, uh, very interesting. Uh, but the, I think the, the most, the, the longest uh, job in, in the cabinet was the deputy foreign minister. Now, as a deputy, you don't have official uh, a role at all. It is up to the minister to decide what you can do and what you are not allowed to do. And I was blessed with a, a very a generous and liberal boss named Shimon Peres. Who, uh, who told me, Yossi, you can do whatever you want. Uh, we, we worked, uh, we had worked with each other for many, many years and even decades. So he knew that uh, more or less what kind of crazy thing I can, I, I know. And uh, so I had quite a big room for, for uh, maneuver. Uh, before the elections of 92, in which Robin became again the prime minister and the uh, Labour uh, was the big winner, uh, I was offered by uh, Terje Larsen, the Norwegian head of the think tank, uh, that if uh, I am playing a, a role in, in the peace process, and I would like to have any kind of uh, back channel that uh, Oslo could be, could host such a back channel. Uh, and we, we talked about what kind of back channel it could be. We already talked with some Palestinians about it. And um, I said that I'm sure that we will need such a, a back channel. Uh, and uh, eventually, Rabin was elected. Paris became the foreign minister. Although they were rivals and he hate each other in an inexplicable way. But th there was a real hatred between Shimon Peres and Yitzhak Rabin. And, uh, and I, I tried to understand what happened in the talks between Israel and the Arab uh, neighbors, which took place in uh, Washington after the Madrid conference and were stuck. And uh, I understood that the, the talks between us and the, and the Palestinians in the context of the Jordanian-Palestinian joint delegation went nowhere. And that somebody had to intervene and to find solutions for the thorny issues between the parties. So I negotiated the, the possibility of a, of, of a uh, back channel with uh, my, my counterpart in Norway, my deputy uh, uh, foreign minister there. He came to Israel, and they asked me to uh, to begin or suggested that we should begin the, uh, the talks. It took some months. 
And then one evening I, uh, I came to, uh, to Paris. You, every evening I would uh, come to his office to uh, sum up the day and to uh, decide upon uh, things that have to be done uh, tomorrow. And uh, the, the idea, the original idea, was that uh, I will go to Oslo and meet the Faisal Husseini, who was the Palestinian leader of, of the East Jerusalem then, and was involved with the Palestinian delegation to Washington. And uh, before I, I uh, asked, I, I, I told him about this option, which I was sure he would uh, immediately accept, that there was no problem with it. I saw his face. Paris could not hide anything. I mean, you always saw it on his face. And he was, I would not say humiliated already, but, but frustrated. So I said, Paris, uh, Shimon, what, what is going on with you? He said, I, I did not uh, tell you about it, but uh, I want you to know. When Rabin talked with me about the future government a few months ago, uh, he offered me the foreign ministry. But he said that I would not be involved with any bilateral channel, not with the Syrians, neither with the Lebanese, nor with the Jordanians or the Palestinians. And I said, and he said, okay. So I said, yes. I mean, I wanted to tell him, Shimon, I would have never agreed to something like this. It was a disgrace. But Paris was one of those people who believe that if you are in politics, don't leave your place because things change. I never bought it, I must admit. But this was his belief. And um, he said, now, I uh, wanted to meet with Faisal Husseini. He used to meet with Faisal Husseini as I used to meet with Faisal Husseini. He was a very interesting person, and a, a Palestinian patriot who knew that part of, of the national aims of the Palestinians is to make peace with us. And he said, I, uh, in, in the weekly meeting with the prime minister, I raised this point and I said to him that I am, intend to meet with uh, Faisal Husseini. And to my surprise, he said, no way, you are not going to meet with him. I told you that you are not dealing with the bilateral uh, channel. So how come you do? And he had to uh, call off the meeting. And I'm, I'm coming to him now and I, I, in order to tell him that I'm going to meet with uh, Faisal Husseini in Oslo. And for me, that was a very, very important point, a crossroad, if you wish. Had I told him, you know, I, I just came to tell you about my meeting with him, but if you don't meet with him, of course, I, I, I will not meet with him. Or I could uh, just hide it from him and uh, give up on my, pro on my own meeting with uh, 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 Faisal Husseini, send the proxies, and try to see if something can be done with the Palestinians in order to solve problems, uh, which were then on the agenda with the Palestinian de official delegation in Washington. And eventually, this was my original idea to, uh, to tell the two, the two parties, I mean, Rabin and Arafat should have told them that solutions were found for their uh, differences and bridged or whatever, 
so that they can now finish the job because there is a solution, but it will be signed between the two delegations. This was my, my original idea. So I asked Yair Hirschfeld, my close uh, friend, who is a, a, a really a researcher on the Palestinian issue, and uh, his assistant, his former student, uh, Ron Pundak, to replace me. They went uh, uh, to uh, Oslo and met with, uh, not with uh, Faisal Husseini, because Faisal would meet with only with me, but, but with uh, Abu Allah, uh, who was a PLO person, but it was four days after the waiver of, uh, for meetings with PLO people. The Knesset changed the law, so it was legal. They met with, with uh, him and his delegation, and the rest is history. I could come to Paris again, only it, was, it did not take much time when they have a joint draft agreement on, on few points, because then it was, it was proving that uh, the channel is not just another a futile meeting between the parties, but something that could bring us to an agreement. And then Paris brought it to uh, Rabin. I was afraid that Rabin would be furious, uh, but uh, Rabin was wise enough to understand that uh, there is an opportunity there. There is a paper agreed upon on the, on the outstanding issues of the interim agreement between the two sides. Now, Rabin's uh, main uh, uh, promise in the campaign was that in three to six months, he would have an agreement with the Palestinians. And he, he didn't have a clue how to do that. And nothing happened. And, and as I said, Washington was frozen. So now, in, in out of the blue, somebody puts on his desk a solution. He just has to, to grab it, which he did, and paid with his life for, for uh, grabbing it. So generally speaking, this was the, the uniqueness of the, of the Oslo Agreement. Uh, when people said, uh, you did it uh, behind the backs of Paris and Rabin, this was not my intention. I mean, my intention was to tell them and to, or, or to tell my boss, my Paris, that uh, I intended to uh, participate in such a channel. But Paris really, uh, su to surprise me, is not the world. I mean, uh, he he more than surprised me by telling me the strange story of his restrictions, and at the end, both of them got the Nobel Prize. You can imagine something like this. I mean, on the one hand, he tells his, his deputy or ally, uh, you don't touch the peace process. On the other hand, both of them, after a few months, are getting the Nobel Prize. So by, by working on the Oslo Agreement, I achieved one thing which was important for me, and that is to, re to have a partner, because the joint Jordanian-Palestinian uh, uh, delegation was so artificial, and there were no official PLO people, while the PLO was representing the Palestinians, whether we liked it or not, and was ready to recognize us. So in Oslo, uh, in, in a uh, side letter, uh, which was much more publicized and perhaps even more important than the Oslo Agreement itself. There was the mutual uh, uh, recognition of Israel and the, and the PLO. So we had the, the partner. We did not have the solutions, not for the interim agreement, but for the permanent agreement, which should, should have taken place in five years. Jerusalem, the refugees, the, uh, the settlements, and, and other uh, major 
major issues, security. So you know what happened after Oslo. I mean, violence erupted. We did not expect such level of violence. I'm talking to my, about myself. I mean, I thought that extremists on both sides would demonstrate here and there, uh, block roads and things like that. But suicide bomber, I must admit, I did not think about it. Or an Israeli doctor, a, a, an officer in the army, uh, killing 29 uh, worshippers in Hebron, Palestinian uh, worshippers in, in Hebron, Baruch Goldstein, it was beyond my darkest nightmares. Not to speak about the assassination of Rabin, which was the end of the world for somebody like me, and not, not, not only for somebody like me. That in my country, in my democracy, a Jew would kill the prime minister. So th there were so, mu so much difficulties then. And, and of course, since then, we are playing the blame game, uh, the, the Palestinians saying that Israel was the, in, in charge of the, of the fact that uh, we, d we didn't have an agreement after five years. And, and the Israel would say it about the Palestinians. Bickering became our most important uh, profession. So then the question was, maybe you can have an interim agreement, even that is difficult, but to have a permanent agreement, to agree on the division of Jerusalem, give me a break. Give me a break. This is impossible. So I tried my best. I was involved in the official talks later on, and I will not uh, uh, get to into the details. But after the end of the negotiations on the official, uh, on the permanent agreement, uh, which did not bear fruit in 2001 in the Taba talks, in which I was in charge on the committee about uh, uh, refugees, a group of Palestinians which thought that uh, that we were very close to an agreement and a group of Israelis decided to try informally to write down a, per a detailed permanent agreement. And we found out that uh, the devil is not necessarily in the details. I don't know whether God is there, but the devil is not there. We did not find any devil. We found out that if you sit together with the other side and talk like human beings, you can find solutions for all the, the thorny issues or outstanding issues. And there is always something that you can exchange for what you want. By the way, I'm telling you in brackets. It is very important to come with to the negotiations with priorities. Because if you are coming to negotiations with a list of requests, and the other side comes with an endless list of requests, I don't know what is really important for you. And we can, I can suggest to you something that is totally unimportant for you. And then you have to, to uh, expose yourself and say, Please don't uh, buy me by giving me something like that. I need A. So it is possible. And, and, and again, people are saying it is like buying a car. First of all, today buying a car is not exactly as it was 50 years ago. But even if you buy a car, the seller doesn't say it costs, I don't know, half a billion, and you say it is not more than two dollars, right? It's never, you, you, you know more or less what is the price. And sometimes you say, but you had an accident, so uh, please uh, uh, take off, I don't know what, $1,000. The idea of 
which was the idea of Golda Meir. I'm not coming to the negotiations with, a map, with maps. It was idiotic, idiotic. You may say to the, to the world or to the other side, these are very important things for me. For example, for Israel, the most important thing is to not to allow every Palestinian refugee or descendants of Palestinian refugees to come uh, back to their homes because then Israel will not be a Jewish state anymore. That is not easy. That is not uncriticized. But for us, this is the most important thing. The Palestinians are looking at this uh, aim in a very uh, critical way. They say, but you know, you banished us. Now you have to accept them back. What, what is the big deal? This is a, an inalienable uh, uh, right. Uh, yeah, but what is important for you? The Temple Mount, Haram Sharif, for the Palestinians. Nothing is more important than them. Now, if Temple Mount is part of my red lines, and the, ref the refugees or the non-refugees, or just accepting a symbolic number of refugees, but of course not opening the, the, the door to them totally, is the most important thing for me, I have to decide to give up on the Temple Mount, which is more symbolic than anything else. And as you know, perhaps, that very, uh, very uh, uh, religious uh, Jews don't go to the Temple Mount because of religious uh, uh, reasons. So you exchange actually part of the red line. Without doing that, there, there is no, con uh, no, no negotiations. You come. You say, OK, these are my conditions to ourselves, to the delegation, to your own delegation. And then you find out that you must give up on something in order to get something which is a red line for the other side. And this was what, we hap what, what, was happened, in, uh, what happened in, 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 Gen in the Geneva talks. It became Geneva because the government of uh, Switzerland uh, uh, sponsored it uh, eventually and sponsored the huge event which took place about 20 years ago uh, to show it uh, uh, to the world. So we had a partner. Now we had solution for all the, the outstanding issues. And still nothing happened. And still violence continued. And still we blamed each other. And still, we excelled in bickering. Now, to uh, jump to, to our days, my, my uh, understanding was that the most difficult issue for the Israeli prime minister, from right or from left, is the issue of evacuating settlers from their homes. Even in, in uh, Gaza, it was not a peace treaty, but it was a unilateral step to evacuate about uh, 9,000 uh, 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 settlers was, was a very, very big uh, deal. And my conclusion was that uh, evacuating them would be the main impediment for anybody who wants peace. I mean, if you, don't, if you speak about people who are against a, a Palestinian state or are not ready to talk to the other side, like our former Prime Minister Bennett, he said that he would not meet with Abu Mazen, he would, not, uh, he, he would uh, be against a Palestinian state. But those who are ready for a Palestinian state, like Lapid, like Sharon, from both uh, camps, if they get a way to jump over this stage and not to evacuate settlers, might be able to go for the two-state solution and the partition of the land. And that, that actually uh, is, is one of the, of the reasons for the 
uh, for the Confederation. Another was, there was criticism, ag criticism against us and against the Palestinians that we dealt with the problems of 67, namely the border, but not of the root causes of the conflict, namely the refugees, but not only. And what we did in uh, our work, again, Palestinians and Israelis together, it is not an Israeli uh, suggestion or Palestinian suggestion, but a joint one. For the first time in history, I think so, Israelis and Palestinians wrote a joint narrative. Not each one uh, his own or her own narrative, written on one page. There is a book like that, which is called Side by Side, and it is a good one, in which the narratives are written on the same page, on each, each uh, issue. But here, it was, it was something else. We tried to tell the story together, and again, when we sat together, and we worked on it, we found out that it is possible because we are not arguing about the events. We are arguing about who was first and who caused it, who caused it but not what happened. So you, we took all the main events of the uh, 100 years of, of, of conflict and, uh, and wrote the, the, the view, our view about it, our joint view about it, sometimes they differed, sometimes they were the same. And if you, if you have, if you read the, the, the uh, Confederation paper, you see there the narrative, 20 pages of narrative, uh, which is, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy with, with this ability. So, to end my story, what, what I try to do systematically, and of course it is never me only, but it is a group of people who did not give up on peace and who was, were not ready to say, okay, we don't have a partner, as if if we don't have a partner, it is okay to have a non-Jewish state under our rule. We don't, I mean, in my view, the only alternative to a two-state solution is a unilateral withdrawal like the one we did in Gaza, and this is really the, the last resort. Because we have a partner. We have Palestinians on the other side. Uh, they are not uh, our employees, and they may be frustrated, and they may use force against us. Eventually, more of them are killed by us than uh, the, the other way. Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have a partner. We have a partner in Abu Mazen, I, I, and I believe that his successors uh, will, will be the same. So we have a partner, which is the PLO. We have the solutions, which are the Clinton parameters or the Geneva Initiative. And we have an idea of an umbrella which is actually on, which, which puts itself on the two-state solution and makes it easier to have the two-state solution by solving the issue of the, of the settlements, which will be to the east of the future border, namely not under Israel. So my hope is that we will, that it is all a, it took us, us much more time than expected but that all these uh, uh, stages are the preparation for an agreement between Israel and Palestine, despite the fact of the split on the Palestinian side between the PLO and Hamas and other things, or, or uh, politicians in Israel who sometimes are the leaders of Israel and who are against it. But I think for me, the most important thing was to prepare the, the needs for the decision makers. 
And this is mainly because I was one of them. And I, I know the ignorance, the political whims, the issues which may have an impact and are irrelevant on the, uh, on the issue, on, on solving issues. And I believe that in a way, what you need to do is to put a book on the desk of the, de of the decision maker and say, okay, now what do you want? You want a partner? You want a solution? You don't want to evacuate settlers? Read it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation and the wealth of your knowledge. So for me, uh, you have to understand that my only uh, real political experience in terms of uh, Israeli, and as you phrased, Palestinian relationships is through the University of Life. I've had studied it in, like I have studied pharmacy, studied law at the universities. And only recently have I come to think that maybe there is an opportunity for two-state solution based primarily on a very dear friend of mine who spent uh, at least six months uh, in Dubai and Jerusalem uh, working on the Abraham Accords, which I think is uh, a huge step in the right direction. Then yesterday, the signing of a uh, deal with uh, Lebanon, uh, not Hezbollah. And I noticed you mentioned only once Hamas. You didn't talk a lot about Lebanon, but you talked about Pal Gaza. To me, it seems uh, that the deal struck with Lebanon was able to be done notwithstanding Hezbollah's objection. So it seems to me that while you may think you have a partner, if there are multiple factions within whoever your partner is, uh, you don't have the right people at the table. So my thought is, uh, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, that in order to have peace, the Iranian proxies, uh, Hezbollah in uh, Iran and Hamas in Gaza, have to be out of the equation. And then I think we could really have true, meaningful peace. Thank you. Uh, it is true. I mean, you cannot force them to, to make peace. You can force them to run away. You can force them whatever, but not to make peace. So uh, both of them are not uh, partners for peace for the time being. What happened with Hezbollah? Uh, in Lebanon is very interesting. The, it surprised me, I must admit. The fact that eventually they understood that they could not prevent from their own people the uh, opportunity to benefit from the oil, uh, the gas uh, 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 field. And eventually they had to accept it while saying, yeah, it is not a, a political agreement, it's not Israel, we do not recognize. Oh, okay, we all understand it. But if you, you have an agreement like that, even if it is uh, signed by uh, separately or whatever, uh, we, we are uh, very good in playing these games. We were forced to, economically, I mean, to find, ha have agreements with I can tell you from morning to night what kind of games we, we, we played uh, against the Arab boycott with the Arab states themselves in order not to expose the fact that we are, we are dealing with them. 
So this is another one. But now it is against the whole world. I mean, the, the, it is vis-a-vis -vis the whole world. And uh, it is an agreement between Lebanon and Israel. It was signed yesterday. Uh, thanks heaven. It is, it is a wonderful uh, uh, event, mainly because people, I mean, the extremists always see the world as a zero-sum game, always. And those who were, you know, occasionally interviewed about the game uh, was, were asked uh, by uh, the radio or the TV reporter, what do you think about the, the agreement? I don't know, I didn't see it, but if the Lebanese are so happy, it means that it is bad for Israel. Kindergarten, even not then, even not there. I mean, it is really a classical win-win, classical win-win. By the way, speaking about learning from social uh, laws in, in, in the academy and, and, uh, and life. You can have it. You can really find a way that both sides will claim victory. And there is nothing better than that. I mean, if one is saying, I, I won, and the other said, I had to submit, I mean, without comparing, it is back to uh, 1918. You don't want such solutions. You don't want it. You want both sides to be happy. And this is exactly what happened yesterday, and, and thank you for mentioning it. Now about Hamas, Hamas is not, I mean, I have a personal problem with Hamas, I must admit. After we signed the Geneva Initiative in 2003, the Hamas people used to take the coffins of myself and Yasser Abed Rabo, my counterpart, from the mosque to the big square in Gaza and burn them every Friday for three months. So for me, it's personal. But having said that, Hamas is not a partner right now for peace. If Hamas changes, like the PLO, and says we are ready for peace with Israel, fine. As long as they are not, they should not be the ones which would torpedo peace between us and the Palestinians who want peace. Meaning, and we are referring to it, our agreement should be with the Palestinian uh, uh, leadership, namely the PLO. With the PLO, we signed the Oslo Agreement. With the PLO, we signed the Interim Agreement of 95, which was conducive to the Rabin assassination. Now, the agreement will include Gaza and a safe uh, passage between Gaza and the West Bank. If Hamas wants to recognize Israel and be part of this peace process, welcome. If Hamas says it is treason and whatever, don't participate. But we will make peace with the PLO first in the West Bank. And it will be an open offer for Hamas for the future to join this agreement. But to say, as some of my friends are saying, we cannot have a, an agreement with the Palestinians as long as they don't put their, uh, their home in order is a mistake because it gives Hamas a huge leverage upon a peace treaty which we shouldn't give them. They don't deserve it. By the way, Hamas is not a proxy of Iran. The Islamic Jihad is a proxy of Iran. Hamas is playing a different uh, game, and they are not proxies of uh, Qatar, but they, they are much closer to Qatar than to Iran. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, I'm in Professor Aronoff's class, and we've been researching this topic, and it seems like the current prime minister and his party are they seem to be more hawkish than dovish, as we've been learning, and they're not quite as willing to make concessions in the negotiations on the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Do you think that under this current party, 
a resolution could be reached, or do you think a more liberal party like the Labor Party would be required for this? Well, first of all, I, I believe uh, yeah, that you, you mean Bennett, right, when you speak about the current prime minister, because the current prime minister went to the UN just a few weeks ago and said that he is committed to the two-state solution. So I think that he is exactly the kind of a person who may find it easier to go for the two-state solution because he never shared with, with the public the way he wants to get to a two-state solution. But I think that for somebody like him, a confederation might be very, very helpful because he will not have to, to deal with the settlers. Not that the settlers will like what we are suggesting. I don't want to mislead you. They will demonstrate and whatever, but there will not be a situation whereby they are waiting in their homes for the army or the, for the police, and the police is taking them out of, of their homes and dragging them and whatever as it happened in the past in, in Gaza and in the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, so uh, he is exactly the model of a leader, although we prepared this, uh, we began our work uh, already three years ago. Uh, we did not envisage that he would be the prime minister, but he is exactly the kind of, pe of a person who says the solution is a two-state solution we need it, it is our national interest. It will take time, not now. Why not now? Now is the time, any time is the time. But, uh, but if, if the prime minister says, I'm against a two-state solution, then of course, such an idea will not help him. I, I am not a student. <laughs> I was watching, uh, I, I re-watched the movie Exodus recently, um, which came out in the 60s for everybody that was born in the 90s here. Uh, and it was such a positive view of Israel that was a big hit in America at that time. And I thought of that movie being released today and it would be impossible for it to be released today. And I'm wondering if you can track for us how, um, how it has come about that the world has sort of turned its back on Israel in many ways and has become such a negative flashpoint on college campuses in the US. And uh, could you add also your thoughts about BDS? Well, um, we all watched the uh, well, our generation watched uh, Exodus. Uh, I met with Leon Lewis, and uh, you know, I, it was like meeting, uh, I don't know what, Moshe Rabbeinu. Um, it, it was, it, it was a, a wonderful uh, movie for its days. It could not be produced today, with or without the BDS. It's a... Uh, it's black and white, and, and the history is not black and white. But Paul Newman was wonderful, and, uh, and it, was, it was really, I mean, even now when I'm, I'm speaking about it, I'm shivering. It is, it is really something which changed a lot, and it, it shows how much the art can be of influence, because it influenced a generation. And then there was the, the Six Day War, which, uh, which uh, became a most important, the most important milestone in the relations between, the, uh, is, uh, between Israel and the American Jewry. Um, what happened to us? What happened to us is that 67 was our biggest blessing and our biggest curse. It was a blessing because people prepared cemeteries in Tel Aviv and in other places because they took seriously the president, the, the Egyptian president Nasser threat to annihilate Israel and to destroy it. And we didn't know whether they had 
the ability to do that and what kind of, of Russian weaponry they had and whatever. And suddenly, we found ourselves in area three, big, three times bigger than Israel itself. We could go on to Damascus, to Cairo. I mean, the ways were open. Not to speak about uh, Amman in Jordan. So we became heroes. And uh, we bragged a lot. And we, we felt that we were invincible. The problem was that rather than leaving the territories, as we did in the past, we conquered the Sana Peninsula three times. So the, the way was to say, OK, we won. Now let's have a, another agreement or whatever and go back to the 67 borders, mutatis mutandis. Jerusalem, perhaps, we could change a little bit or something like this. Rather than that, the right spoke about we will never go back, we will remain where we are. And the left spoke about a, a, a territorial compromise which was not accepted by any Arab leader. Now, during the years, Israel had the feeling that because it was a defensive war, 100%, I can testify, it could remain in the territories until the, the Arab countries are ready for peace in, under our conditions. After so many years to justify the occupation by saying that it was a war in which we had to defend our lives is very difficult. So Israel is still under the, the feeling that the whole world is against it because we had to defend ourselves and we fought and we, sorry, we won. And the world says, hey, enough is enough. I mean, 67 is history. By now, <laughs> you have to leave the territories. You left uh, the Sana Peninsula, very nice. Now, what about the West Bank? And we say, they are terrorists. And you know, in, all, in many other wars, even in, in Russia, uh, uh, Ukraine, you hear the word terrorists by one side. They are terrorists, they are terrorists. So the world is saying, you cannot call everybody who is hurting you a terrorist. You have to compromise. And we understand, I mean, the, the, the peace camp in Israel say, there is no situation in the world that a minority of Jews will dominate a majority of Arabs. It was never in the books of, of, of Zionism. The whole idea of Zionism was democracy. And once it is a minority against a majority, it's not a it is not a democracy anymore. The BDS is a nonviolent uh, way, of course, but I, I believe that it will never help. Because what happens under BDS or other BDSs in the world is that we unite against it. I mean, you don't want somebody like me to be the main fighter against the Palestinian wishes. But if the, the weapon is to boycott me, I cannot say, thank you very much, it is a good idea. So I have to fight against it. Now, the, the main idea, the world can help us by suggesting ideas, by shuttling policies. I mean, what happened to us is that the world lives with the conflict. If it is not fire, the firefighters don't come. And usually, the leadership of the world is made of firefighters. I can understand it. I can understand it. Usually, I mean, speaking about a leadership of a state, the, the worst thing is whether something good, bad happened, right? You come to the office in the Ministry of Justice, Something happened, 
something happened, somebody ran away from a prison or whatever. No? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Because had it happened, I would have to go there and understand it and to go to the TV and to explain that it is a real event and the, the number of, uh, of uh, prisoners went down. You know, all these things that you hate to do, but you must. So the world doesn't come anymore. Uh, there is no war. From time to time, some exchange of fire. OK, tolerable. The, 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 the world is generally a one-issue world, and it is now Ukraine and Russia. And if uh, nothing terrible, uh, God forbid, happens in, in between us and the Palestinians, it doesn't come. I need, I need, I mean, I'm, I'm selfish. I need the world to come. I need the United States to come. I need a special envoy, for example, for the Middle East peace process. Where are the Dennis Rosses of today? They are not. They don't come. Somebody has to, to have an office in which he gets up in the morning and says, what about the, the Palestinian-Israeli peace process? And there is no one who does it. So rather than threatening me by BDSs and explaining to me that it is the right thing, is that this is not the right thing. The right thing is, I mean, again, this is my history. I'm trying to break my small head on peace ideas. Maybe the, con the, the confederation idea is a not, not good enough an idea. Maybe I, I, I'm not sure that this is the best idea. If this is not good enough, let us break our heads about another one. Rather than to threaten me, because the threats will not help. It will unite a front against them. And I'm not sure that this is the real wish of those who are behind the medias. I'm also not an MSU student, <laughs> but I was at one time and have a minor in Jewish studies. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, being a student with Dr. Aronoff in her class on Israeli culture and politics. And one of the things that uh, obviously we discussed in her class was the Palestinian refugee. And you mentioned that Palestinian refugee problem was one of the priorities, correct, of the Palestinians? So. The, what about that issue, what amazes me is that so many people are aware of the Palestinian refugee issue and I'm amazed how, many, how few people are aware that more than a million Jews were expelled from Arab countries. So my question, you know, how can the Palestinians, it's a, it's a balance there, how can the Palestinians say this is a priority for us when Jews, we have more than a million Jews expelled from Arab countries? Yeah. What do they say? First of all, it is on the agenda. It is always uh, raised and, uh, by, uh, by Israelis in the negotiations. And uh, the, in, in some cases, the, the Palestinians said, first of all, the answer of the Palestinians is that you did not raise it with Jordan. You did not raise it with Egypt. Why are you raising it with us? We are the other refugees. So you, you have to demand from the Arab world, from Iraq, from Iran, which is not an Arab uh, state, uh, and from others uh, to compensate the, the Jews who ran away from, uh, uh, from the East. Uh, but don't ask it from us. We are the other refugees, uh, which is not uh, idiotic. I mean, this is uh, an answer. The other answer is that our refugee, the Jewish refugees are not refugees anymore, while the Palestinians uh, tried to, to uh, keep the status as refugees, keep the, the refugee camps, were against rehabilitating uh, refugees in order to keep the issue against the world. And in the meantime, people were born and died in these uh, refugee camps rather than being rehabilitated. I mean, Israel was ready to rehabilitate uh, Palestinian refugees from camps, and they were against it. So, I mean, the, the bottom line is that uh, once we negotiate seriously about peace, 
and talk about the refugees, the issue of the Jewish refugees will be raised again in the negotiations. What will be, but, but here it will be the world who will, be, who will have to be involved in compensating them, especially those who can prove their assets in the Arab world, rather than the Palestinians. I mean, they will not be in a position to compensate, and they, they will not be demanded to do that. Okay, thank you. I have another question uh, focusing on uh, refugees and what you, what you touched upon in your talk. Um, I'm also, in one way, not a student. I'm 78 years old. But in another way, I'm always a student. Um, and so um, it's been 30 years since um, um, President Clinton was in office. He was in office until, I should say, he was in office for eight years. And he left in 2001, January 20th. But while he was uh, in the summer of 2000, when the campaign was on, the election was coming up, he was in Detroit and he was campaigning for his vice president, uh, Gore. And I had an opportunity to, uh, I went to a fundraiser and I had a moment to talk with him and I said, well, uh, are you gonna be able to put this together before you leave office? And he said, I have, uh, I have some optimism about it. And he says, and, and we're so close in so many ways. And I'm sure during the process, positions, it was a long process, so positions changed, things are tried. I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I know I negotiate, but it's usually about money. Uh, this is a, obviously much more complex. And, uh, and I think it was like right before he left office that he came the closest of putting the parties together. And the issue of refugees seemed to be something brought up at the last minute. And I, I'm asking for your perspective on this because you read certain things and there's different positions on it. But um, it seemed to appear that Arafat came in at the last minute with a ridiculous number that he wanted to bring into the country for refugees that was just so overwhelmingly not possible that it became a total deal breaker. And so my question to you is, was there a smaller number concerning refugees that was considered to be allowed by the Israeli side? And was it really a deal breaker that at the end of the day, the number was so large that it, uh, that it could never work out? That's my question. Well, I, I can tell you that in the talks between uh, Ehud Olmert as the Prime Minister and Arafat uh, in 2008, in, our past. In, in, with Abu Mazen, sorry, in 2008, Abu Mazen spoke about 100,000 refugees and Olmert spoke about 5,000 refugees. It sounds a big gap, it is not. It is not. The feeling of Olmert was that it was uh, bridgeable. Uh, the way to bridge it was time. Yeah, I mean, it, it means to, to uh, rather than do it in five years, to do it in 10 years, and then you can have a bigger number, something like that. Now, if we uh, divide Jerusalem, and those Arabs who live in the Arab uh, neighborhoods, uh, close to 400,000 uh, Palestinians will not be under our uh, control, then even 100,000 is a much smaller number than 400,000, which will not be there. So it is soluble. I mean, in our, in the Geneva uh, Initiative, there is a whole annex uh, to solve the, the, uh, the refugee problem. And uh, we agreed on, with the Palestinians on, on a solution. We were not officials, they were not officials, but we found a solution for the refugees because they understand that Israel cannot absorb all the refugees. It is beyond the, 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 the readiness of the most, most modest Zionists 
If you are not a Zionist, then the issue doesn't interest you. But if you are, you must have a Jewish majority. So you cannot absorb them. But in symbolic uh, absorption and the uh, gradual one, uh, reparations, uh, paying them for their assets, I mean, reparations for, for uh, their plight and paying them for uh, um, uh, realistic uh, sum of money uh, for the assets will solve the problem. You could say that um, what happened 30 years ago or 20 years ago uh, would not apply to now, but I, I think if you had peace partners that were ready to talk again, uh, that the old maps and the old ideas would certainly be a good starting point because apparently it was very close at one time. Mutatis mutandis. Mutatis mutandis. I mean, for example, I can give you an, an example, speaking about uh, maps. In the Geneva Initiative, which is adopted by the Confederation uh, Group, we suggested to annex 2.25% of the West Bank fully compensated in land to the Palestinian state. Now, it did not include Har Choma in Jerusalem. It was not uh, uh, populated then. Today, about 35,000 uh, people live there. So it will be quite uh, impossible to, to evacuate them. And Israel will have to pay something for that in land. So you are right. The maps of the past may be a basis for the maps of the future, but not exactly so. Thank you. Thank you very much.